Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to a special edition of Popcorn and Compliance. While we typically look at the movies over this short podcast series, Megan Doherty, co-founder of One Stone Creative, and myself will take a look at The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So not technically a movie, but streaming on the Disney platform, so that's close enough during this pandemic. Over this series, we will take a look at the storylines, some of the cookies and other cool things. We'll describe the great action scenes from each um, episode, and then we'll take a look at issues raised by each episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. We will take things from the societal angle, from the social justice angle, from the MCU angle, and perhaps even from the compliance angle. But if you're an MCU fan or you're a compliance fan, I know you will enjoy this episode, Megan and I take a look at episode three of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This podcast is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox back again with Megan Doherty, co founder of One Stone Creative, for another episode of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Today, we're going to take up episode three. Uh, we are going to be discussing the episode, so if you haven't seen it and you don't want to, watch it and then come back for our podcast. So, Megan, can we just jump right into it? Let's do it. Okay, a short synopsis. Unbeknownst to Sam Wilson, Bucky Barnes orchestrates a prison ride to help Zemo escape, and he agrees to help stop the Flag Smashers. They travel to travel to Madripoor, a criminal sanction uh, sanctuary city island, suspiciously looking like Hong Kong, and meets with high-ranking criminal Selby. She reveals that the power broker hired former Hydra scientist Wilfred Nagel to recreate the super soldier serum. Wilson's identity is exposed in a call from his sister Sarah, and Selby is killed, and a bounty is subsequently placed on uh, Sam Wilson, Bucky Barnes, and Zemo as they escape the bar that uh, they met her in. Sharon Carter, who's been living as a fugitive, one of my all-time favorites, I would note, (laughs) saves them from bounty hunters and brings them to Nagel's lab. They learn he has recreated 20 doses of the serum, which Morgenthal, that's Carly Morgenthal, stole. Zemo unexpectedly kills Nagel and the lab is destroyed and Zemo steals a getaway vehicle. Sharon Carter stays behind And Sam Wilson agrees to obtain a pardon for her. Walker and Hoskins, rather, uh, Walker and Bucky arrive in Berlin and deduce that Barnes and Wilson have helped Zemo escape. While the Flag Smashers raid a global repatriation council storage facility in Lithuania for supplies, Zemo, Barnes, and Wilson travel to Latvia in search of Carly Morgenthal. Barnes recognizes Wakandan tracking devices when they confront Ayo, who demands Zemo, uh, and frankly, one of the great reveals of all time. So, Megan, lots going on here. Maybe we could start with cookies and other cool stuff. What did you see? Yeah, well, the first one was right at the beginning. So they were playing what was basically an ad for the Global Repatriation Council, um, which sidebar has the same acronym as the Mounties in French, Les Gendarmes Royaux de Canada. So that was a little confusing visually. But otherwise, um, I did notice their logo. Um, it was little dots joining into one, getting larger and, and reassembling into a form like the people who were unblipped. Um, so I thought that was interesting. But it also really made me think that um, it was so shiny and so pleasant. And I, I think the government may be the biggest bad of all. Um, in this series, just based on that commercial, which was the same um, kind of storytelling strategy they used in WandaVision, which I thought was interesting, having the commercial embedded right in in the show we were watching. That's certainly true. And, and really your point about uh, the government and all this, it was definitely driven home in WandaVision. And uh, I'm waiting to see how it might play out here. But uh, I think uh, whoever the government is, the omnipotent they are behind a lot of this. Yeah, and, and is is it even country governments anymore? I think countries are different than they were before the blip. Uh, so what countries, who's working together, what are the new alliances? I, I think all of that has to be revealed. Uh, next one was uh, New Cap Walker saying, don't even let them breathe when they were on that first mission at the beginning. Wow, yikes, for a statement. Um, 
And I, he seems to be the only unilingual superhero because all of the other ones so far speak other languages. Well, that's very American. <laughs> Captain America, why would he speak anything else? And if they don't understand, just speak louder. <laughs> that will certainly help. Very American. Uh, I, I used to, I believed until I was well into my teens, actually, that um, Spanish was America's second language the same way French was Canada's second language. I thought it was like exactly the same. I was really surprised to learn that it, that it wasn't. It is where I live. Well, that's good. It's a lovely language. Um, Machiavelli. Okay, that was fun. Zemo reading Machiavelli. Um, and I think that revealed the whole theme of the episode, which is the ends justify the means and whether or not that is true and for whom it is true. Um, so to polish off the one year of a liberal arts degree, I didn't finish. Um, yeah, Machiavelli's whole idea of what is virtue and what is virtue for a leader versus a citizen, I think is something that they're, they're playing with in this episode really strongly. Um, and many of our main characters dealt with that idea of is what we're doing justified for the end that we're achieving. Uh, Cap said it. I think Zemo's doing it. Uh, Bucky's doing it. Uh, I think that's hopefully a theme that's going to play out further. So just a delicious episode. Um, uh, I'm liking Zemo more and more. Uh, He is uh, not simply evil. He's not simply brilliant, but he's rich. Rich, rich, rich. (laughs) And, and and royalty on hard times. He's a noble. And he's a noble. <laughs> so, uh, you know, every girl's dream of the ultimate bad boy. <laughs> but he, uh, and I think that adds a completely new dimension to his character. Plus, we get to see some incredibly cool toys that we'll talk about in a minute. Mm-hmm. But a couple of things that struck me. Uh, one, we knew how smart he was, and that seems to certainly have been expanded out in this but the thing that um, um, uh, struck me was he's uh, very subliminally, and this may tie into your therapist comment, trying to re-initiate uh, control of Bucky. And um, mm-hmm. when they go into the bar in Madripoor, he communicates to them, you have to stay in character. You have to stay in character at all times. And at one point uh, early or maybe at mid in the bar scene, they're attacked and he commands uh, Bucky to attack. And the question I had is, is Bucky responding to the command or is Bucky in character as the Winter Soldier? Uh, Because I thought Bucky was in character, but you seem to think that that maybe something else is going on, that maybe Zemo's got a little more control than we are believing at this point. What, uh, What really led you to think maybe... He's actually controlling Bucky as the Winter Soldier, not as Bucky Barnes. Uh, I, I thought it was more, I, I saw more in the therapist role as how he was almost mediating between Sam and Bucky rather than his control of, of Bucky himself. I think it's really unclear whether or not Bucky was 100% being controlled. Um, but contrasting how he's relating to the two of them and how the therapist from the previous two episodes was relating to them, which was, while very brisk, um, you know, good cognitive behavioral talk therapy. And this was reminded me of exposure therapy. He's got to get over this and the talking and the not hurting anyone wasn't working about, wasn't working out, but, uh, you know, maybe reacting, uh, taking ownership and while mentally present doing what he had done as the winter soldier as a way of integrating those two parts of himself, I think that could be a legitimate, ther- legitimate therapeutic practice as well. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I was going with that one. Sharon Carter, uh, lovely lady, yes. uh, played a really small but very interesting role in the, in the Winter Soldier movie. And she, in the final scene, we saw her in that movie. The, her final scene was she helped Bucky and Sam escape with their equipment. And she had to go on the lam. And she turns up in Madripoor. It's not clear from this episode of the television series if she was blipped uh, or not. My guess is no, because she seems to have accumulated a fair amount of power. But I found the evolution of Agent Sharon Carter actually consistent with a lot of, uh, I read a lot of thrillers. And you have uh, particularly U.S. agency uh, operatives go rogue. But here, uh, when you're put out uh, to dry, or hung out to dry, rather, you use the skill set you have. And she is obviously a very good uh, skill set as an agency operative, so she's just moved over to the dark side. And uh, the um, 
end the scene where she drives off with an associate and says, we have a problem. That's when it clicked to me that maybe she's the power broker. I really hope she's the power broker. (laughs) But what confused me there was Zemo said he knew the power broker by reputation only. Mm -hmm. And he's been in prison the entire time and not been blipped. So that led me to conclude that the power broker existed while he, on the timeline where he was uh, in the movie of a civil war, which was before even um, Sam and the original cap uh, captain America went on the lamb. Um, So I I found that either confusing or a little inconsistent. What if um, the, Power Broker is a title like the Dread Pirate Roberts from The Princess Bride, and it's something that different people can assume. It's a mythological character used to, to scare yeah. uh, people. So that that could certainly be true. <laughs> to, to scare the feds. <laughs> to scare the feds. You know, I, I talked about why I thought uh, the Baron was cool. What, what did you see in this episode that led you to uh, have enhanced coolness from him? The plane was good. Um, and that jacket he wore while he was walking towards the plane and then during the fight, that was a great jacket. That was the jacket of someone who has enough money for someone to buy them really cool things. <laughs> um, and I like the relationship he had with, um, I guess, the major domo of the plane when they were kind of joking about, you know, the wine and, oh yeah, give, give the Americans the bad food, they won't notice. Um, it really, it, it, it seemed very natural to him and having that relationship. So I, I, I buy the backstory. I think he probably was, uh, you know, a if not maybe a noble, a very rich um, Eastern European person. So I won't fault you for this uh, because the car came out before you were born. Uh, (laughs) But they drove off in a 1968 Firebird convertible. That's pretty cool. And it is so awesome. (laughs) It sounds so throaty and it sounds so cool. And for me, uh, that that synced in. You you can always have a, a vet convertible. You have a Mustang convertible. Very cool. But... A Firebird is a much rarer car uh, now, and to have a Firebird convertible is even rarer. So I I thought that was extraordinarily cool. What did you think about the move from um, certainly in one and two where we're creating a backstory, then explaining really in detail the current psychological and uh, physiological problems of both Bucky and Sam? Obviously, the therapy Mm -hmm. sessions were a cornerstone of that. But this one, in episode three, we seem to move to uh, not only the the action ramp up, but uh, a a spy or thriller. Any thoughts along that? There's no reason it can't do both. Uh, And and I I hope it does, because, I mean, I I like spy thrillers. They're fun to watch. This was an extremely exciting episode. Um, And I hope they don't shy away from kind of the topics and themes they opened up in the first couple of episodes. Um, because, you know, the more engaging something is to watch, the more people are going to engage with it. And that's really important conversations to be having. Um, yeah, I'm just hoping they, they continue to bring up the important issues. I did read that they had to do some reshooting and re-editing of parts of the show because one of their original plot lines was really similar to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And they thought that might be a little, a little too much. So they had to change some things in post, um, which maybe is part of what we're seeing as well. What was your thoughts about the bar scene with Bucky and his attack? Uh, I mean, you talked about it in terms of potential therapy. Is that something, if it, if it went down that road, is that something that a person really could think of and do on their own? Or will they really need a therapist or, or counselor or, or someone to guide them through that? Um, I'd say having it be guided would probably be wise, especially when there's the strong likelihood of um, um, blood and maiming. Um, and I think I said this, I think maybe before we turned on recording, but um, Zemo was giving me Hannibal Lecter vibes uh, in terms of, you know, his appreciation for the finer things and also, you know, keen psychological awareness um, and pleasure, perhaps, in manipulating people. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was, uh, I mean, obviously it was a means to an end of finding uh, finding the doctor and then finding getting closer to the power broker, but also maybe just kind of toying with these superheroes who put him in jail. Might be just a fun time for him. Do you think Zemo had the escape, his escape plan in his head and he communicated to Bucky what to do? Or was it Bucky's plan that he communicated to Zemo? Because it was Bucky that gave him the uh, tools to spring him from prison, although it was Zemo who executed. 
That's a great question. I hadn't thought about that. And I'm, I'm not sure which direction that would have come from. I, I could see an argument either way. That'll probably come to light uh, as, as we get to see more of their relationship in the next couple of weeks. Any other thoughts on uh, Sharon Carter that, that either I didn't talk about or we didn't talk about earlier in terms of her role, where what she's been up to, perhaps being the power broker or any? Uh, it's very cool that she was a stolen art dealer. And I thought there was a really nice little moment when Sam was looking at the, the art and saying, these can't be real. Like, no, they're real. The fakes are in the museums. Nothing he believes is real is real. Um, he, he gave the shield to the museum and they took it away. Nothing in the actual museums is real. I think that was just, they're really hammering on him. Uh, and, and, and his perception of reality. I thought that was interesting. And I, I think Agent Carter's fight was awesome. <laughs> that was a really good fight scene. <laughs> So that that's really, I wanted to spend mm-hmm. some time on that because when we did our first podcast, we opened with the air chase, air rescue scene, which we both agreed awesome. was awesome. Well, this one was awesome. <laughs> and I saw more uh, uh, pyrokinetics, uh, things blown up by sure if they had good safety distances <laughs> um, because they has a very big, powerful bangs. And uh, they had people that looked like they were very close to uh, to some of those. But um, one of the articles I read really talked about this that fight scene being the coming out of Sharon Carter mm-hmm. because it said she was merciless. Um, she used knives. She used uh, guns. She used the bad guys' guns. She used the bad guys. <laughs> it was no hesitation whatsoever. None. No hesitation. Um, and when I saw that, though, I attributed that to just – basic training. But the articles seem to suggest that, no, it, it was really an indicia of basic training plus. Really, any thoughts on her in the fight? Because it was awesome. I mean, yeah, and this may be my, my naivete about, uh, you know, what basic training would mean um, in a military con- uh, context. But I, I would assume, you know, an initial goal would be to disable but not necessarily kill outright in many situations. Uh, and obviously, you know, this is a, a big fight, but she was really going for it. And and she had no trouble being outnumbered hugely. Um, so I'm guessing this wasn't the first time it's happened. Um, you know, there's there's no way this was our first rodeo. So, <laughs> so I think this is not a, like, maybe not necessarily in, you know, a storage container depot. Um, but she's done this before. So what about the big reveal at the end? Did that surprise you? Were you expecting it? And where do you think this may take us? Uh, the, the, the big reveal she get Oh yes. Sorry. I miss, I was thinking the Sharon Carter big reveal. Um, I was pretty delighted to hear that Wakandan theme music again. Um, that, that was pretty great. I had no idea what was happening at first with the little balls. I didn't recognize them as, uh, as, as that tech. Um, I think they might have another ambiguous force against them. I'm not going to say good guy or bad guy because you know, the Wakandans are good guys, but they're probably going to be working at odds with our, our buddy cop, um, duo. So I, I think that's going to be really fascinating. What, what was your thought? You thought this was really exciting, I think. I did. I was completely blown away. I uh, didn't recognize the tech. And if uh, the tech we're talking about is... Uh, um, the little, little beads. Call them guide lights or sensors or something. But they, yeah, they appeared in, early on in um, the first Black, or I guess the only Black Panther movie, when he's rescuing the women uh, who have been captured or human or being human trafficked and um those show up and bucky follows them and io says i want zemo and we haven't really seen i think it's been hinted at wakandan revenge but we've not really seen that um with the exception of the uh uh, son who came back and and tried uh to kill the then king um but um it was uh I, I just love it that these relatively minor characters mm-hmm. are being elevated. I've always enjoyed that in books, TV shows, and movies, and, and that is what we are getting. And if the <laughs> Wakandans are after him, it's like having the Israelis after you. They will never give up. Yeah, and I think that's going to be particularly challenging because uh, Bucky has such a relationship with them. You know, I spent time with them, became, you know, work with them. I think that working at odds is going to be, I think, really emotionally challenging. As well as, you know, physically terrifying. (laughs) So, uh, uh, but it was a delicious, uh, just delicious way to end. 
One other point I wanted to raise was that the new cap, uh, Walker and Hoskins, come to Berlin, which was uh, where Zemo was being held in prison. And they uh, are at the prison and they either deduce or I guess they do deduce that um, Bucky has helped Zemo escape. When I saw that scene, um, I really thought it, it emphasized not simply that they were a day late and a dollar short, but they didn't have the hold all the intelligence cards that uh, Bucky, Sam, and Zemo hold. I assume they're going to show up and gum up something at some point, but I didn't think that that scene particularly portrayed them in a favorable light. Any thoughts on that scene? I think it was distinctly unfavorable. I, I think they were they were on the Machiavellian side of Machiavelli. Uh, they you know they were, <laughs> um, and, and it was really interesting because we had, they'd kind of set Walker up to be you know maybe a. a well-meaning but not terribly on the ball propaganda piece. Um, but he really feels like he's got something to do. And I think he's got, they've got some plan. They're, they're working on something. They want to achieve something. They don't care how they do it because they think the reward for doing it right will be enough. I don't think we know what that is yet. Yeah. And I think they're, right. they're, I don't know, maybe just represent, like, I don't know if they're, they're meant to be their own unit of, of kind of independent actors or representative of the larger government that's backing them. Uh, I don't feel clear about that yet. Well, uh, it was a great episode, lots to unpack, lots of uh, foreshadowing for what we may see in the future, and uh, it's been a rare TV show that uh, I look forward to on a Friday night. Not, not a big TV <laughs> night in the Fox household, so uh, uh, it's, it drops every Friday night, so if you haven't checked it out, do so, um, and, and or uh, follow us on this podcast. See you next time. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Popcorn and Compliance. Megan and I will be back together next week where we take a look at the next episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You should check out some of the other offerings on the Compliance Podcast Network. We have a new offering of Coffee and Regs, and we have Mo Forecast, the podcast from the Morrison and Forster law firm hosted by fan favorite from the FCPA Compliance Report, James Kukios. Thanks again for listening. Please join us again next week. This has been a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network.